Good morning, Friendship Village. Good morning. Good morning. Now, the most important announcement I have. I do have an introduction, but this is an announcement. As you may have noticed, the coffee and pastries are missing. Boo. But when you leave, there will be pastries to take. So you can have them back in your room without your mask. Richard Dick Rolf moved from his home in Door, Michigan to Garden Home 4235 on September 23rd, 2020 to live with his new bride, Roberta Gavier Rolf. Where are you, Roberta? Way back. Dick received an associate's degree from Muskegon Community College and served in the U.S. Navy from 1959 to 1963, living in Morocco, North Africa, and Jacksonville, Florida. During his time in Morocco, he met his Italian wife, who has now passed. Their two sons and one daughter live in the Grand Rapids area. There are six grandchildren, seven great-grandchildren, and two great-great-grandchildren. And they're all close, Grand Rapids. If you watch family-friendly films on TV and have noticed the dub seal of approval, you might like to know that Richard Rolf was the co-founder and the CEO of the Dove Foundation, Grand Rapids, Michigan, for 25 years. Its mission is to encourage and promote creation, production, distribution, and consumption of wholesale family entertainment. Under Rolf's leadership, the Dove Foundation's Dove Seal of Approval has become a familiar and respected brand throughout the entertainment industry. Many industry leaders like Steve Allen, Dean Jones, Michael Med Medved rallied to help Rolf with his quest. Dick's national television appearances include NBC News, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, Entertainment Tonight, and PBS Freedom Speaks. He has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Variety, Billboard, The Hollywood Reporter, Forbes, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and The London Financial Times. Friendship Village residents, please welcome Richard Dick Rolf, who will present Making a Difference in Hollywood. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Well, Dick, thank you for that uh, introduction, uh, which I authored. So. <laughs> it shows you my writing skills, right? I can make something out of nothing. And um, But first of all, I want to stop. Oh, I, I put my notes. Sorry about that. I'm not going to touch it. I want to start by thanking uh, Friendship Village for, especially people like Allie, and Nancy Kutarski and the others for making this such an enjoyable place to live. I've really enjoyed every minute that I've been here. And uh, <laughs> and um, I'm just uh, grateful for the opportunity to have so many friends and, and cohorts and uh, people in the uh, business uh, and here at Friendship Village. Um, since I have 45 minutes to cover 80 years, 
Uh, I promise to be speedy, but engaging. Uh, and hopefully my octogenarian peers won't fall asleep, that's a hint, <laughs> during my presentation. Uh, some of the, first of all, um, I was, 1942 was a memorable year, for me anyway, but it had a lot of firsts, including uh, because of Pearl Harbor the preceding December, uh, World War II was officially underway in February of 42. Also, the Women's Army Auxiliary was officially launched to the U.S. government, and Ken and Iola Rolfe officially introduced to the world their newborn son, Richard, a.k.a. Little Dickie. If anybody calls me that, they're dead. <laughs> My life story uh, consists of, uh, as I said, 80 years, and I'm gonna take a, a large chunk of that and put it together in a 12-minute video. I hope you're entertained, informed, and you enjoy what you see. Hello. That was not good. Try again.
reached down to the six foot man in a 50 foot hole. And the image came back to me of when I was a child and God reached down and took me out of the lost condition and set me on the right path. So from that point on, I rededicated my life to Christ and he changed everything for me. He restored my family, he restored my spiritual life. And interestingly enough, he gave me opportunities in the workforce to be able to do Christian ministry. Now my passion was to honor God, but I never dreamed that he would give me the opportunity to honor him in ministry. series of positions in ministry, my wife and I became aware of the entertainment revolution and we saw the VHS tapes coming out in the video rental stores and we became immediately alarmed at the kind of content that our kids might be exposed to. And it was at that point that we began reviewing movies ahead of time so that our kids could have choices, but they were choices that we had control. This uh, list that we built of dub-approved movies was intended for only family and friends, but uh, it became so popular that eventually it turned into a national movement, and we incorporated it into the Dub Foundation. Dub has now approved about 1,100 movies, built a following among family or faith-based audiences, and sealed solid box office and claims for scores of films like Because of Wind Dixie. If you ignore that audience, you do that at your peril because they make up a sizable number of your potential audience base. Let's not that credibility in that marketplace that's critical to the success of family pictures. We reviewed over 10,000 movies in 25 years, and the Dove Seal has now become the gold standard that Hollywood uses when they're trying to reach out to that audience. And we're very proud of that. We think that that's something that God, in his wisdom, has allowed us to do uh, to create something that uh, references the Holy Spirit, the dove, as a guide for families to look for good, wholesome, God-honoring entertainment. When I think about where I am today versus where I was 30 years ago, it's hard to believe that uh, God has allowed me the privilege of serving him in the ways that he has. The voice over the radio saved my life, and that was a message from God's lips to my ears. I can only hope that we have delivered a message to the ears of other hurting people and changed their lives and showed them that God is the better choice than the world. I'm going to focus uh, the rest of my talk on the Dove Foundation. Uh, when you lived for 80 years, as uh, many other people who have already uh, done what I'm doing today will attest, you've got to find a slice that's uh, entertaining and interesting and uh, unique. You can't just take the whole 80 years. So, so I'm uh, going to talk about Hollywood and uh, talk about the fact that uh, in 1991, uh, the list that we sent out was finally got, had gotten to the point where we needed to formally incorporate uh, so that we could get some funding to start doing more than just putting out a list of movies. Uh, and so we created a mission and the mission was to encourage and promote the creation, production, distribution of wholesome family entertainment. The action plan, that was another problem. Uh, we knew what we wanted to do we didn't have a clue how we were going to do it. Um, we, I had never been to California in my life, much less Hollywood. So I didn't know what we were going to do, but uh, we just figured we'd somehow do it. Well, I, I, then I got an invitation out of, literally out of the blue. And this 
invitation, by the way, is six months before our incorporation. Uh, in February 9th of 1991, uh, I got a, a call from a lady in Hollywood, California. Uh, her name was uh, Rebecca Gibson. She was the president of the Hollywood Anti-Pornography Coalition, and she wanted to give me an award. I said, I haven't done anything yet. She said, well, we read the article about you in the newspaper, and uh, we think that uh, you've got something worth supporting, and we want to encourage you to continue with it. So, okay, so, so I said, okay, where do I report? <laughs> and she said, well, uh, we're gonna give you the Homer E. Young uh, Award for Promoting Family-Friendly Entertainment, and the award and some other awards over there on that table. So I asked her, I said, well, where do I go to get this award? She said, well, you come to Hollywood. But she said, we'll pay all your expenses and you can stay overnight with my husband and me. Uh, so that'd be fine. So I got on a plane, got up to LA, started driving down Hollywood Boulevard, not knowing where I was going, but I was going to the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. That's what she told me. So I finally, driving down Hollywood Boulevard, I yep, saw this big sign on top of the building, Roosevelt Hotel. So that must be the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. So I walked into the lobby and I looked and in the lobby there were hundreds of pictures of um, movie stars from the 1920s and they were all holding some kind of a, an award. And I didn't know what that was about and I finally Rebecca walked out of the ballroom and there was a lot of noise going on in there and she walked out and she said, Dick, I'm Rebecca Gibson, uh, I'm your host for this event. Uh, I said, well, would you first of all tell me what it is about these uh, trophies, these uh, pictures that are all in there? She said, oh, you don't know? She said, this is the home of the first Academy Awards ceremony in 1929. And she said, furthermore, you're going to be in the same room that the Academy Awards were, were, off, uh, were given. <laughs> okay. I thought that's a mighty big room for just a little award. Well, when I, she led me into the room, um, all of a sudden I looked around and there were about 250, maybe 300 people at round tables eating lunch. And um, I saw the, the dais, the raised stage like this, and there were three chairs at the table and two of them were held by some very austere, very uh, stout looking gentlemen. And I found out that they were the Cardinal Roger Mahoney, the Archbishop of the Los Angeles Archdiocese, and Reverend Lloyd Ogilvie, the, uh, the rector at Hollywood Presbyterian Church, who, by the way, later on, became the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. And so, uh, during the presentation, it all of a sudden dawned on me that they were gonna ask me to say something. So, so I'm madly writing on a napkin uh, some words that I might be able to give that would, you know, it, in, in, impact people or impress them or whatever. So I get up there, step, step up to the microphone and nothing comes out of my mouth, not a peep. Uh, later on, I was told I had hysterical laryngitis. <laughs> anyway, whatever it was, I couldn't talk. So I, I thought, well, I've got to do something. So I, I started whispering as loudly as I could into the microphone and I thanked them for the award. And I said, by the way, for those of you who don't hear well, I usually sound just like him. And I pointed to Lloyd Ogilvie, who had this beautiful uh, basso profundo voice. And I said, by the way, for those who don't, uh, oops, did I get ahead of myself? There. But for those of you who don't see well, I look just like him too. So. <laughs> well, that kind of warmed me up to the audience. and. Uh, Rebecca immediately uh, started ushering me around to greet the people at the tables and to find out who they were. And I didn't know, but it didn't take me very long to figure out that these were some of the movers and shakers in Hollywood. These were writers, producers, directors, actors, actresses, uh, people who really impact what we see at the movie theaters or on, online now every day. <laughs> but the one unique thing that they all had in common was that they were uh, passionate about wholesome family entertainment. They were tired of all of the sex and language and violence and nudity and drug and alcohol use and everything. And they wanted to support an effort 
that would be a, bring a kinder, gentler theme to the movies in Hollywood. So naturally, I was happy to apply. Uh, so the Dove Foundation, we conducted a study in 1997. One thing I learned about Hollywood was that you got to watch what you're proposing to them. Uh, you got to speak their language. Because unlike those of us in uh, Hollywood, in mid-America, we are not like the uh, coast, the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, they don't speak our language and we don't speak there. <clears throat> and so I had to figure out what it was that motivated them most and I found out, not surprisingly, it was profit. But it was more than profit, it was audience. They wanted the biggest audience they could get in their movies. And so we had a study done uh, that was supported by some of our donors, uh, which was one of the most ambitious studies I think I've ever seen. They had eight million people that they surveyed by phone and the data revealed uh, some important information. I'm just going to skip through these. Uh, but they're all uh, opposed to uh, offensive material, but, uh, too much sex, violence, and profanity in movies. Uh, and most surprisingly to Hollywood, the, the population was discouraged by the MPAA rating system. They felt it wasn't accurate, and they didn't trust it. Well, that was a blow to Hollywood's ego because they had set this up, hopefully, to impress the people, the customers. The other thing I learned while I was there, and while I was learning my ropes in Hollywood, was that family is not a genre. When you think of genres, genres are like comedy, drama, action, adventure, mystery. Uh, those are genre uh, biopics. But, a family is actually a psychographic profile of a like-minded people who all enjoy all genres, uh, but with certain limits of content to reflect their values. So family is not a genre. Hollywood had family as a genre. So they were saying Disney movies, those are family. Well, that's, <laughs> there are a lot of family movies beyond Disney, but they didn't realize the gold they had in their own pockets. Um, Got it. <laughs> so um, that was part of the learning experience that we were able to provide to them along the way. Uh, and we also showed them and demonstrated that people of faith embrace the same values as the family does. Uh, they enjoy all kinds of entertainment, but they want limits on the entertainment that they watch. So for 35 years, the Duff Foundation has tried to represent the faith and family audience. We did another landmark study in 2012, and uh, we found out something very interesting. Um, by this time, there were enough approved, dub approved movies, so that we could actually do a study on the profitability of those compared to the profitability of regular movies that did not meet the Hollywood uh, criteria, or the dub criteria. But the first study we showed uh, showed films from night from 2005 to 2009, and it explained that uh, there were the average G-rated movie made 108.5 million dollars as profit. The average R-rated movie, ready, 12.7 million dollars profit. That was a real eye opener to Hollywood. But even further than that, we drilled down by separating the films into two categories: dub approved, not dub approved. We found that the dub approved movies on average made $90.8 million, $90 million each compared with $36.3 million each of those movies that did not receive the dub seal. Now, we knew that the, the place to influence was actually the buyers of movies. Uh, the audience is too big to try and uh, please. So we went to the middleman in the chain. From the studios, we went to the video store owners who are responsible for disseminating the movies that uh, you and I see or did at one time uh, see. And so we went to those people and we joined the Video Software Dealer Association and they had a, a convention every year in Las Vegas. And so we uh, put up a display 
and exhibited there at the dumps at the uh, VSDA, and it was amazing how many uh, video store owners decided they wanted to sign up. In a relatively short order, we had almost 9,000 video stores around the country that wanted to sign up to get the, a Dove section. That was a seal of approval on their videos that they could stick her right on their videos from our list. Uh, and some uh, point of purchase uh, uh, material that they could use. Uh, shelf talkers, window decals, uh, all kinds of things like that. So we had a, a pretty big audience all of a sudden. We were actually bigger. Uh, there were more video stores that carried the Dove program than there were blockbuster video stores. So that was pretty interesting. Anyway, um, so we've been known for 30 years as an advocate for faith and family audience and for our credibility within the entertainment community. We had two primary objectives, to encourage Hollywood to make more wholesome movies and to empower families to make wise choices. Mao Zedong one time said, the people vote with their feet, which means that the movies you support are sending a message, an indelible message to Hollywood, give me more of those. They don't know that you walked out in anger because the movie offended you. All they know is you bought a ticket. And so well, our message is to people to be discriminating and look before you leap. Uh, you can go to the Dove Foundation website, dove.org, and you can read reviews of virtually every movie uh, in, um, almost in existence, I think there are like, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 now that we've uh, reviewed. I think the numbers are later in the pro program. Uh, Dove endorses movies uh, with family values in all entertainment genres. There's a Dove seal for each category. The first Dove seal is uh, uh, called a family approved seal, and we had two categories, all ages and 12 plus, because obviously even some family approved family approved movies had themes that were too sophisticated for very young kids. So we divided those into two categories, all ages and 12 plus. Then one of my board members, uh, Les Dietzman, came to me and said, Dick, I got a problem. He was the president of Family Christian Stores, the one of the largest Christian bookstores in the country. He said, the problem is, you've only put dove seals on uh, secular movies. I said, but Les, I never thought that a Billy Graham film would need a dove seal. <laughs> he said, well, you're wrong. He said, unfortunately, because of merchandising, we're putting all of the dove approved movies into a section in all of our stores, and a lot of the other store chains are, are going to follow suit and do the same thing. It's the first time that videos, that uh, Christian bookstores were able to put movies in their stores, but they felt that the dove uh, criteria was uh, clear enough and um, family friendly enough, I guess, so that they could include those titles in their stores, but they wanted also to include the faith titles. So we developed a new seal called a faith friendly seal, and that uh, we put on movies that had some um, spiritual inspiration or a spiritual story to it. Now you'll notice also there's a faith. Uh, based film with a caution. This covers some of the movies that are kind of outliers, that are so explicit in their content, but they're still, um, they fall into the faith category. Probably Passion of the Christ is a good example of that. Uh, well, that wouldn't be considered to be a family-friendly movie, but um, it would be, um, it would be uh, appropriate for the, for the faith audience. So that is the, the layout of the Dove seals of approval. Now, for results, uh, we now track and see where we've been and where we're going. And we have become, according to Hollywood, the primary trusted source for family movie reviews. There are over 12,000, there we are, the number, 12,000 movies and scripts that have been reviewed. And I think that number's higher now. Uh, and over 8,000 titles have received the Dove seal of approval. These are some of the studios that we worked with over the years, and many of them actually ended up hiring us to advise their production teams on how to make family movies out of some of the scripts that they had already developed. 
Um, later on, because of the technology change, uh, where movies all of a sudden went from video stores to your television screen, um, Hollywood had another, or the uh, family-friendly films had another problem. How do we sort those out uh, when they're on like Netflix or Hulu or someplace like that? Well, a friend of mine uh, who was the president of a company called Cinedyne, uh, they had office in New York and LA, uh, he said, he came to me and he said, Dick, he said, we're going to create an over-the-top, what they call OTT channel, and we want to call it the Dove channel, and we want it to include only movies that Dove's approved. Well, this is a wonderful news for us because this moves us from endorsing films to providing the films for people to watch, which we saw as a major step forward. So naturally, we were in favor of it, and now you can find it on dovechannel.com, and on almost every um, special uh, group of uh, special channels that you get on your television, like Roku and some of those, uh, all of those have the Dove channel as an option that you can get to. Um, here's an example of some of the uh, things that we were able to do with the studios in Hollywood. I don't know if many of you remember Mr. Popper's Penguins, uh, but it was a Jim Carrey movie. And uh, Jim at the time was not really known for a lot of family-friendly movies. So uh, 20th Century Fox wanted to distinguish this movie from some of the other Jim Carrey movies. And so they called it uh, Dove Approved, and uh, this was their room. This Father's Day weekend. Place is coming together, huh? Yes! You'll laugh. He's a keeper. You'll cry because the fishing raised the bar to a whole new level. You'll fall in love. Oh, I'll show you the not fair. Bring your family closer together with the will of the Dove family seal of approval. There's just some things you can't afford to miss. Yeah, family. Mr. Popper's Penguins. Step all change. Word. Read PG. So that uh, was how they advanced and promoted the uh, Mr. Popper's Penguins. Uh, they had print ads in the LA Times, they had billboards, and uh, retail displays when it came out on DVD. So we were quite honored by that. Uh, Dove Revenues uh, is kind of interesting. Many of you have come out of the nonprofit world and you understand the struggle it is in raising money. Um, we had the same struggle that everybody else had. But we found our primary source of revenue in 1993 was donations. That was individual and corporate, and of course, major donors. But uh, our source of revenue changed as of 2000, and we started getting fees for services from the studios who were paying us for our advice. Uh, which I never thought would ever happen. <laughs> but they actually would send us a movie um, by Courier. This is back in the 35 millimeter days. They'd send it by Courier, and the Courier would stream the movie uh, at the theater, and then he would sit down in front with nighttime goggles on to watch us to make sure we didn't videotape the movie that he was showing us. Because these were in pre-production form. They hadn't yet been totally finalized. Uh, they didn't have the uh, closing credits, some of them didn't have color correction and some other uh, fine tuning issues. But they wanted to get it to us as soon as possible to see if it met our, our criteria for content. And those that did, we gave them a letter right away to take back to the studio, attaboy. <clears throat> those that didn't, they wanted to know what it was about the movie that missed the mark for us. And so we would write a very detailed report about what that was, and they'd send it back. Um, to my astonishment, about 25% of those movies were changed and, uh, and uh, released with the changes that we had recommended. I had never anticipated that. I thought they just wanted to know uh, what they were up against uh, by the movie, I did, you know, that they were not going to get rid of seals. So, oh, so what? You know, we'll go somewhere else. But 25% of those films actually did get changed um, by the producers and directors uh, before they were released. And uh, some of the studios that hired us were 20th Century Fox, Sony, TriStar, uh, and later on MGM. 
under the auspices of Mark Burnett, who became a very critical person in our life. I'll share more of that later. But then in, in 2014, the revenue doubled because of the royalties from the Dove brand and the library in the, um, the, the Dove movies that were online. Um, this Dove channel, we worked out a deal with, the, with Cynodyne. We got 25% of the gross profit. Now, understand, Hollywood never talks about gross profit. They talk about net profit because they want to take all of the money they can out of the movie before they declare a profit, which is usually maybe 2%, 3%. Um, but our negotiation with Cynodyne was 25% of gross. Well, that turned out to be a pretty big stake. Uh, and you'll see why later when you see the size of the audience that the Dub Channel has. <laughs> but um, a sizable part of our, of our income came from the library of the Dub Channel. And some of the people that helped me along the way, you've already heard uh, Dick tell you that uh, Steve Allen was one of our mentors. Um, I had a very interesting experience meeting Steve. I don't know if I have time to tell this, but I think I will now. The, um, we were producing a special called Hollywood's Impact on Family Values, and we were doing it at Hollywood Presbyterian Church. The Mirror Center, which is a, uh, like a theater uh, on the premises, uh, had loaned us the property, and uh, some friends of ours who were in the film business provided all the cameras and the crew and everything so that we could put on this little special and it was to appear on CBS as a one-time special called Hollywood's Impact on Family Values. What we were trying to do was make the case that even people in Hollywood were sometimes disturbed, if not disgusted, about the content that was coming out of their studio. And so we got insiders, people with reputations, who were willing to stand up and say, this stuff really is not what I'm about. I do not support this. Uh, I'm in the community that makes it, but I don't consider myself a part of it. So, uh, my, the director asked me when we were putting together the cast and everything, said, who would you like to host this? And I said, I don't know, host that. I don't see that one. <laughs> I just threw the name out and said, you know, Dick, he says, I've got his name in my Rolodex. He said, let's see if we can get a hold of him. So he calls up on his cell phone and puts it on speaker. And the voice says, uh, Mr. Allen's office. And the director says, yes, yes, this is John Reiner. Um, he said, I'm the director of a special that's going to be done by Dove and Dick Rolf, the head of the Dove Foundation, wants to know if Mr. Allen would be available on such and such a day at such and such a time to host this panel discussion. She said, just a minute. She didn't put the phone up. Oh, she yells back. She said, hey, Mr. Allen, Dick from Dove wants to know if you could show up at the Mirror Center at Hollywood Presbyterian Church for this special, this TV special. She came back and said, yeah, he's available. Give me that. <laughs> I said, well, we'll certainly give him an honorarium. He said, no, 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 he doesn't need one. He said, except he would like you to send him 100 bucks because he needs to get his toupee done. <laughs> 100 bucks, that's easy. I said, we'll also send a car for him. He said, no, no, he prefers to drive himself. He knows where Hollywood Presbyterian is. He'll, he'll see you there on time. He didn't want anything in advance. No um, cue cards or no rundown on the show. If, if you know anything about Steve Allen, you knew that he was one of the greatest, um, uh, what do you call him? Uh, ad lib. Ad lib, thank you. Uh, ad libbers in the business. And he was always funny. He opened his mouth and funny came out. Um, so anyway, oh, back up. So um, Steve uh, pulled up to the uh, lot, uh, to the uh, church, uh, right on time, and uh, he got out, he went into makeup, and we gave him some three by five cards, which had uh, a little bit of a rundown on what the show was about, because we did want to know then, uh, so that he could kind of get prepared for the theme and all that. And he's reading the cards, and he's looking at it, and he gets kind of a query look on his face, and he says, hey, Rolf, he says, come here. I said, 
I got there and he says, what is the Dove Foundation? And I said, well, I told him, it's, you know, entertainment uh, monitor looking for wholesome family entertainment kind of thing. So you know, he's got to laugh. And again, Steve Allen has this one and only Steve Allen laugh, and it just kind of fills the room. Oh, 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 oh. I said, excuse me, Mr. Allen, what was funny about what I said? Well, I'll tell you. He said, when my secretary told me that Dick from Dove wanted me to appear, he said, I have a contract with the Dove audio people who do audio books of my, write my books. And the contract says, whenever I'm available, I have to appear at one of their events. That's what I thought I was doing here. Great. So I thought, okay, this man's gonna get up and leave because he was here under false pretenses. He said, no, no, no. He says, I love what you're doing. He says, we need more of this. He said, matter of fact, I'm working with several fellow comedians and we're trying to get clean comedy nights at some of the comedy clubs around the country so that families can come and enjoy uh, the entertainment as well. So he said, I'm down with you 100%. Well, from that time on, he became one of our strongest and most vocal uh, supporters, uh, and um, including getting us uh, on the um, Christian Cathedral with uh, Reverend Bob Schuller. Uh, Steve and I were booked on the show, uh, and we were there to do nothing but tell about the Duff Foundation. And uh, Schuller had a huge audience back in the Christian Cathedral days. And um, we got a lot of press and a lot of coverage from that. So we were very appreciative of that. And then, of course, uh, Steve was just uh, with us all the time. He would fly in. He flew into Grand Rapids on his own dime and did a concert uh, in, uh, at the uh, DeVos Hall, uh, free of charge. Uh, everybody came in and had to give a dollar, uh, but then he, Steve did a fundraising pitch for us <laughs> at the end of his show, uh, and people said they started passing the plate, people started giving money. I mean, it's just the way he was, he was just a super guy. We lost him too early. Um, he and I were talking about faith, uh, which is something that uh, uh, Steve had a background because his wife, Jane Meadows was uh, the daughter of a, a missionary in China. And um, so Steve was uh, awarded um, several uh, awards by the human, Humanist Society for humanita humanist, not Humanitarian, Humanist Award. Um, but he said, that's not really me. He says, I really, he says, I believe there's a God, but I just can't prove it. And I said, well, what has led you to this point? He said, well, he said, you know, I'm called Mr. Television, right? I said, yeah. He says, I can't stand television. He said, when I'm in a hotel room um, traveling, he said, I never watch television. But he said, I'm a, an avid reader. So he said, I look for something to read, and invariably, I pick up the Gideon Bible. And I read, I read it cover to cover tons of times. And he said, it's very insightful, very motivating, but also very confusing in some spots. And I said, you know, Steve, I said, if, if we could get you from where you are, uh, know that God just can't prove it, to where I am, I know there's a God and that he loves me. I guarantee you that would change your life forever. Well, he was kind of curious about the challenge, so he said, oh, all right, let's talk about it. He says, as a matter of fact, I've written a couple of books. Well, a couple of books. The books are like 800 pages each, and it's called um, The Bible, Religion, and Morality. <laughs> it's all about his struggles and his dealings with uh, Christianity and the Bible and uh, the uh, matters of faith and so on. So we began a conversation by phone, email, uh, talking about these issues. Uh, and I also sent him a copy of a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict that was written by Josh McDowell, who's a famous evangelist. Anyway, we talked about this over the, year, over the months. And then um, I found out from his son, Bill, that a very tragic accident had happened. Steve was leaving his office one day, and he, his office was on Van Nuys Boulevard, and the 
building was practically on the highway. I mean, it was like a sidewalk between uh, the building and the highway. And Steve, instead of going out and creeping out and looking slowly for oncoming traffic, he just bolted right out into the street and was T-boned by another car. And he hit, his head hit the corner post of the car. He didn't have a seatbelt on. And the uh, ambulance service came to him and checked him out. He was fully conscious and knew who he was and everything was fine. But he had this real bad bruise on his temple. And the EMTs told him, he said, you know, Mr. Allen, we really want to get you to the hospital. You need some x-rays for this injury. It could be more fatal than it looks, more serious than it looks. No, 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 he says, I'm fine. He said, besides, he says, I'm going to be late for dinner. He said, uh, Jane is uh, up in Wisconsin visiting one of my sons, and I'm staying with Bill and his wife uh, over in the other side of town, and they're expecting me for dinner. So, so he signed a release, and they took him over to Bill's house. Um, I, Bill was relating all of this to me. The sad thing was, he said that, unfortunately, Dick, uh, he seemed a little tired when he was eating, and so he went to bed early and never woke up. And so that was the end of Steve Allen. But his reputation and his legacy certainly lives on, certainly does in my heart. Some of the other people that we were able to meet there, the people of influence, were uh, Mark Girardi, uh, who was the vice president, and Dick Cook, who was the chairman of Walt Disney. These two gentlemen were also very, very pro-family, very um, faithful followers, shall we say. Um, so was Joe Montagna, um, who was, uh, you're, you may be familiar with Criminal Minds, uh, which is a television series that he's had the lead in for many years, uh, which doesn't seem like a person who would be a, <laughs> a conservative, faith, family-friendly guy. <clears throat> but uh, he was. And Dean Jones, who was the perennial Disney uh, lead actor, he was in Herbie and the Love Bug and That Darn Cat and all those different uh, Disney movies. Uh, and so those were friends. And then also we had um, Corbin Bernson and Pat Boone uh, and his wife Shirley and Roma Downey, who you may remember was uh, the angel in Touch by an Angel. And um, she married Mark Burnett, who was uh, one of the other gentlemen that I was referring to before. And then Aaron Buffet and Kirk Cameron uh, and Luciana Pelosi. Uh, here's a gal who was really quite interesting. She was one of the Bond girls in Thunderball. <laughs> and um, she was a wonderful gal. And she was married to a, uh, a studio executive uh, who later became good friends of mine. And, uh, and here is an endorsement from um, Mark and Roma. They filmed this right after they got back from Grand Rapids. They spent three days with us in Grand Rapids because they had just uh, finished a film that they wanted our endorsement of. But they wanted more than an endorsement, they wanted audience reaction. So they asked us to gather together as many people as we could. They, we had a 200, I think 250 seat theater at uh, Celebration Cinema. And we'll come and we'll present the movie and we'll take uh, um, comments from, the, from them. So they had comment cards and everything from the I hope. So when they got done, uh, they were very thankful for our, the work we were doing and everything. And when they got home, this is what they sent me. I had no idea this was coming. Hello, I'm Roma Downey. And I'm Mark Burnett, and I'm his husband. My most important job. Um, for over two decades, uh, Dick Roth and the Dove Foundation have been forging and building very important relationships in the Hollywood community of media professionals. Their purpose is to inspire filmmakers in the community to make more faith and family movies that can give the audiences something much more uplifting to watch. And a Dove Foundation helps families to locate the best and most inspiring movies by publishing reviews online at dove.org 
and uh, by awarding the Dove Seed of Approval. So please join us in supporting the wonderful work that the Dove Foundation does. Thank you, and God bless you. If you're not familiar with uh, Mark Burnett, uh, how many are familiar with the, movie, with the uh, television show Survivor, uh, or The Voice, or um, Shark Tank? Uh, those are all television programs that Mark produces, directs. So our reach as of uh, April 1st of this year, uh, last year now, um, Dove had two million plus followers uh, a month reading our movie reviews. But here's the kicker, here's the thing that surprised me. 5.4 million subscribers to watch Dove Approved Movies on the Dove Channel. And that, my friends, is the end of my presentation. I have a personal update there. <laughs> I just want to add this PS. Um, on April 29th, 2020, Dick Rolfe, uh, of the Dove Foundation, joined Roberta Gabeer, also retired co-founder of Mad Hatters in Holy Matrimony. The one thing we had in common was that we both ran nonprofits, And we were, well, moving past here. We were married on the, uh, after the sailboat in Grand Traverse Bay. And we are enjoying our time together uh, here at Friendship Village and uh, sharing our time and experiences with all of you. And, um, and beyond. Uh, we've been to Hypoexo Island, which is uh, off the coast of Florida, visiting a relative. And beyond. Uh, Villa del Mar in Mexico. We're going to be there again in about two weeks. Or less, a week maybe. Uh, the 13th, and um, enjoy that and beyond. And we just got back uh, not long ago from Thol-sur-Mer in France. Whew, that's a lot of things. But is it really bad? We're going to Como, Italy in summer of next year. And thank you very much. Uh -huh. Any questions? Any questions? I have one. I'm amazed that you were dealing with Hollywood, but you were located in Grand Rapids. Can you talk about that? Because it seemed like you would have been in Hollywood full time. Well, um, there's an interesting thing about uh, staying. The reason I stayed in Grand Rapids is because we never would want to raise kids in Hollywood. I mean, that <laughs> place is just bizarre. Um, so I ended up referring to myself as the ambassador from mid-America. Uh, those people who have different values. You know, we're in the flyover states, uh, which Hollywood really understood. and. Um, so every other week, I would get on a plane on Sunday evening, and, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Monday morning. Uh, I get to Hollywood at 11 o'clock. My first meeting was at noon. Uh, I'd have four meetings that day and three or four meetings a day the rest of the week, and I'd get on a plane at about six o'clock Friday night. And I did that for, 25 years. Oh, so, <laughs> uh, but I enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, we were, we really saw progress being made and so that uh, we made it all worthwhile. So with every other week you were almost 50% Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Questions? You've answered them all. <laughs> Thank you, Dick for a most interesting and informative program. Next week, not next week, next month, February 1st, program will be Dr. Carter Brooks, who will present The Fringes of Medicine. 
Hope to see you then. Don't forget coffee and pastry. Yep. Coffee too? Coffee and pastry. Okay. Oh, by the way, you know, one last word. Um, I uh, have some memorabilia over there uh, on the table uh, from my time in Hollywood, if you're interested. And also, there's a pad there. If you're interested in getting my biography, uh, which I 